and today I would like to give you an update on my 707 project on which I have been working on for quite some time now. Uh, for those who have been following my channel you've probably noticed I started to work on a different 707 as I recently changed my 1976 ex Saudi Arabian Airlines cockpit to this original Lufthansa 707 cockpit from 1960. And I'm very happy to have this one because both my parents actually worked on this particular aircraft. I purchased this cockpit at an auction in October 2021 and soon after was able to raise enough funds to move both the Caraval and the 707 up to Sweden where they will become part of an aviation museum. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for the crowdfunding. It would not have been possible without your help. Now this is one of the oldest 707 cockpits in existence. It was last flown 47 years ago. It is undergoing restoration to its former glory right now and the aim is to build a Boeing 707 flight simulator with all its original equipment and combine that with state-of-the-art simulation technology. And eventually this simulator will replicate the real aircraft in every possible detail and it will allow you to try firsthand what it was like to fly one of the greatest aircraft of all times. My affection for the 707 goes back to my childhood and stems directly from my parents who were both employed by Lufthansa and had the opportunity to work together on the 707. My father as a co-pilot and my mother as a flight attendant. As a child, I would spend hours drawing pictures of Lufthansa 707s. My parents had several flights together and lucky enough they didn't forget the camera on one occasion. These are one of the very few photos I have of both of my parents on duty. Forty years later, I would meet the love of my life the same way on an Airbus A330. Here's my father's logbook and you can see several flights on Delta Alpha Bravo Oscar Delta with the last one in November 1975, prior retirement of the aircraft. My dad every now and then comes up to Sweden, so hopefully I can drag him in front of the camera for an interview. He doesn't have very fond memories of the airplane, but I think that has very much to do with the former World War II crew members he flew with that left a negative perception. Just a brief history of the airframe, first flown on April 5th, 1960 and delivered to Lufthansa in Hamburg 19 days later where the airplane's cabin furnishings were fitted. Named after the city of Frankfurt, it entered service on May 5th, 1960 when the aircraft opened the route LH450 from Frankfurt to Los Angeles via Paris and Montreal. The aircraft remained with the airline up until its last revenue service on November 30th, 1975 following a domestic flight from Frankfurt to Hamburg as LH766. The aircraft accumulated a total time of 59,000 hours and 21,000 landings and only had 39 hours left till its next major overhaul. Delta Alpha Bravo Oscar Delta was subsequently stored in Hamburg until it rolled out from the hangar on February 20th, 1976 in Air Force One colors on the port side only as 26,000 for the movie Twilight's Last Gleaming. With the US serial number taped over and registration Delta Alpha Bravo Oscar Delta applied on the fuselage, the aircraft was then ferried to Munich on March 14th for the movie work the next day. It was ferried back to Hamburg on March 16th, titles and paintings removed and the aircraft was then used by Lufthansa Technik as an instructional airframe until 1999 when it was acquired by the Hamburg airport for the symbolic price of 1 euro. Oscar Delta was used for evacuation training and display, however the airport decided to dispose of the 707 in 2021, blaming the pandemic as a convenient excuse. It was scrapped in June 2021 and parts were sold at auction together with the 707 that used to be stored at Berlin Tegel. This cockpit now resides in Belgium and is being restored by Guy van Herbruggen. Now there are different approaches to convert a real cockpit into a flight simulator. You can use screens, interface the instruments or convert the instruments. All approaches have their pros and cons, but after my Caraval project where I did both interfacing and converting, I decided to go for the conversion approach on the 707. Low cost, low maintenance, high accuracy and reliability is what really stands out with this approach. 
So I bought a CNC milling machine, a 3D printer, and began to convert the original indicators. Complexity varies, with some instruments conversions are being done within a matter of hours, others require months and several prototypes until you find the right solution. Over a period of two years, I have significantly improved my skills and basically have solved all challenges of converting aircraft instruments for flight simulator use. Here's an example of the Coltsman altimeter, very common throughout the 60s and 70s, and since it's a pressure instrument, it is rather difficult, but not impossible, to connect to a computer. The challenge here was to get high resolution, high speed, combined with position feedback for the QNH. Eventually I came up with a geared stepper motor with a switch for position sensing and a 10 turn potentiometer for the QNH. This altimeter has a resolution of 3 feet, up to 50,000 feet and a max speed of 20,000 feet a minute, which should be good enough for simulated emergency descents. The rear part of the altimeter had to be removed and lengthened using a 3D printed part. Some sanding and painting and you can hardly tell the difference to a real gauge. I always keep the original lightning and simply change all bulbs during conversion. Eventually the look and feel is 100% real. Any needle requiring some erratic movement like a nervous ADF needle can be programmed to mimic the real thing in every detail. There's a lot you need to keep in mind when converting flight instruments. Maximum and minimum output, torque, needle speed and size of the instrument itself. The hardware comes from Germany and allows customizing pretty much everything you can think of. The entire simulator runs on 5 volt for lightning and circuit boards and 12 volts for the majority of stepper motors and 28 volts for the panel lightning. An additional static inverter is needed for 115 volts 400 hertz to power the fluorescent bulbs on the glare shield and the flight engineer. I have almost all the parts, with most coming from Uniform Delta, scrapped in Nairobi, Kenya in 2006, supplied by my friend Guy van der Bruggen, and Uniform Fox, better known as 880 Lima, which ended up in Opoloka a couple of years ago. South Africa proved to be a very good source for Lufthansa parts, as a number of former DLH 727s ended up there, and many instruments were interchangeable between various fleets. What makes this project challenging in a way is that um, Lufthansa, like many major airlines, had customized cockpit instruments and cockpits in general with different seats, panel configurations, instruments and markings. These RMIs are a good example and they have DLH in the part number. This Barry HZ6 is also very difficult to find, while a common instrument even today this circular MDA light is what makes it so rare. There are a few parts that I'm still missing. The biggest being the forward ceiling liner and down in the video description you find a link on to my website 707jet.com with the parts I'm still looking for. Meine Damen und Herren, wir möchten Sie bitten, nicht mehr zu rauchen, die Rücken den Senkrecht zu stellen und die Tische hochzuklappen. Vielen Dank. This is what it looks like inside right now. My dad would probably say it's hopeless, but I think it looks pretty promising. The control stand is in Germany right now. It's being 3D scanned by a company that wants to remanufacture them. And I should get that back by May, I would say. And then I need to install all the sensors and everything and the motors, you know, for the, for the trim. And meanwhile, I've been working on the corrosion and there's a lot of it, unfortunately. 50 years of open storage have done some harm to the cockpit. And it takes a lot of time to remove each and every screw and not damaging the original equipment. I think that's, that's very important. It's, it's easy to take the stuff out, but it's, it's, getting, it's getting a bit more difficult when you remove it very carefully. 
because originally I, I do not want to repaint anything. I want to leave everything as is, uh, leave the original patina. That's something I did very differently on the Caraval. Everything is like new standard. Um, yeah, well, the corrosion, it's a lot of work. I removed the brother pedal heels and oh, it's pretty bad sometimes what you see. But on the Caraval, I, I, you got to do it right because on the Caraval, I, I just painted over some areas with corrosion. It takes just two, three years and the corrosion comes back through the paint. So forget that. Do it the right way, even if it takes a lot more time. Yeah, the wiring, I removed all the wiring. Uh, because the, the way they wired the aircraft back in the 60s is, I think, totally useless for what we are doing nowadays with the flight simulators. And I need the space for the new wires. It is just too much work to reconnect the original wiring. And the way they did it, it's, it's very different. So it's, they just need to go. And eventually everything will come forward to the forward bulkhead, where there will be all the uh, circuit boards that will that control the... Um, switches, the lights and the flight instruments, the flight director bars and everything, the, you know, the, all these bars for the ILS, VOR, you name it. So it's going to be pretty complex up there where, where the radome used to be, I mean where the weather used to be. Yeah, um, still a long way ahead, but I think it's going to be something really cool and I really enjoy the work and as I said, I want to do it the right way, so it, it's just taking a lot of time. Some people say it's a pity I removed the original paint, but there was no original paint because the aircraft was repainted twice after its retirement entirely, like Eddie Beinhorn. And I think it was about time to remove the paint because of the condition of the skin. I'm dealing with a lot of uh, pitting corrosion, little holes in the, in the skin, and there's one side and there's one area that is extremely corroded, and I don't even know how to fix that. If you have any idea, let me know. Uh, this is the equipment I'm using most of the time. Actually, I polished the entire caravel using this. Um, the big advantage is that with a good polishing compound, you can put a lot of pressure on it, and it, that makes it easier to remove the scratches and holes. So you get pretty good results. But just to put that into pers uh, perspective, an area like this that had some really uh, serious uh, pitting corrosion takes about an hour. So you can imagine how long it takes to polish all this. And this is just the right side. Now getting that paint off the aircraft was driving me nuts because the eco-friendly paint removers didn't really work the way I wanted to. They dried up too quickly. And eventually I came up with the idea of putting a plastic foil onto the freshly applied uh, paint remover. And that really did the trick. So when you pull that foil off the fuselage, it's, it's really something. It's, it's, it's really cool because then you see all the original paint schemes and, and markings and it's, it's a bit of a, a step back in time, if you want. I found some traces of Air Force One paint when the aircraft was used for the movie, and even some original Lufthansa paint below a filled dent. I was able to find a very good color match after spending hours in various paint shops comparing colors from different manufacturers. You will never get a 100% match because of color aging and fading, but this match should be close enough. One thing that really astonished me is that the original Bemalungsplan, or painting instructions I got from Lufthansa, are actually incorrect. It's hard to believe, but the traces on the aluminum are very clear. The blue stripe is actually 11 cm below the window edge and not 20, like on the drawing. Once the paint is off, the careful inspection for corrosion and measuring of the original color scheme markings begin. Once you start polishing, these traces will disappear forever. So it is essential to make sure you can recreate them exactly the way they were and at the exact same spot. Sound is a very big thing on the 707. While Oscar Delta was actually powered by Rolls Royce Conway engines, A model, as Lufthansa called them, 
The simulator will reproduce the Pratt & Whitney JT3D engine, Moyes or B model. This is because I have all the panels of the B model with JT3D engines. While 99% of the people will consider it noise, it is pure music to my ears. The challenge of recreating that sound in all its detail, however, is significant. Getting re-recordings of the engines is way more difficult than you would initially imagine, as you cannot simply take a YouTube video and extract the sound. Recordings need to be looped, which means you take 20, 10 to 20 seconds of recording and play it over and over again. Any background noise or unsynchronized engine would probably drive you crazy after a few minutes. The idea is to create loops from various power settings and blend them together in a special software according to the power setting of the simulator. I did my first real engine recording of the Calvert back in 2021 when I was invited for a taxi run on the world's last Rolls Royce Avon powered airliner. I was able to bring the power up in one engine to plant power which is almost full power on the Calvert. It was an unforgettable experience and the recordings turn out perfect for creating loops. Check this out. Cool. <laughs> Obviously, turbojets are straightforward in their design and sound output, but it gets more complex with fan engines. The biggest challenge was to get quality recordings in the first place. I got help from a gentleman working on the Pratt & Whitney TF33 engines, which is the military version of the JT3D powering the B-52 and E-3 AWACS aircraft. He helped me providing fantastic clean recordings at various power settings with, syn with synchronized engines and many thanks to him. And I'm still trying to get in touch with active 707 or E8 pilots to record certain sounds on the aircraft on the ground and in flight as well as record noise levels at various stages during the flight. If you're interested in helping me out please get in touch and your effort will be rewarded and of course the equipment will be provided. Besides the beautiful JT3D sound, engine performance is another big issue and I'm stuck here for over two years. To recreate the engine performance throughout the entire operating range from spool up to power output, I'm looking for detailed mass flow charts and compressor maps, which would allow me to have a digital model of the engine, which will be the closest you can get to the real engine. If anyone can provide help here or has an idea where to get this data, please do not hesitate to get in touch with me. One of the most common questions I get is whether I will be using X-Plane or FS2020 as the basis for the simulator. While FS2020 has breathtaking graphics, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. I'm using X-Plane for the Caravel simulator and I'm very happy with the result. General handling, most performance data and pitch and power are very close to the flying manuals. It's not perfect, but no simulator is, not even many of the Level D simulators we use for real pilot training. I haven't really decided yet, but since I have lots of experience now with X-Plane and I'm happy with what I get, I most probably will stick with X-Plane and its great potential. Time will tell. This is it for today. If you like what you saw, hit the like button or subscribe to the channel. And if you happen to know anyone who is actively flying the 707 or E8, and who is willing to help me regarding these uh, sound recordings I mentioned earlier, please get in touch with me. Thanks for watching and see you next time.